All right, count me in whenever we're ready to start recording. Oh, I started recording like 10 seconds ago. Why would you do that? Oh, it provides a banter and filler material to put at the start of the episode. Isn't that just going to sound like lazy and amateurish? Eric, it's what everyone's doing. Welcome to Spec Media. Enjoy the episode. Podcast premise is confusing enough as is. All descriptions of events, people, planets, and species are real. Like fictional real. No fake fictional facts here. The observations, commentary, and analysis are our own. Spoiler warning. If this is, somehow, your first experience with the Star Wars universe, um, go watch the original trilogy first. If it isn't clear, what you're about to hear is a parody that is not affiliated with the podcast, networks, films, or TV series we're spoofing. Come on. What you're about to hear is part three of a multi-part series on the ground war at the Battle of Endor. If you didn't happen to catch the first two parts, you might want to do that before venturing into the middle of the story. But if you don't mind your history in jigsaw puzzle form, welcome to the long-awaited, sorry about that, part three. I know it's been a long time between episodes in true hardcore history fashion. I picked a topic that required a lot, some would say too much, research. Don't worry, we have a plan to keep episodes coming out. So without further ado, part three of Behold a Forest Moon. In this series, I've spent a lot of time discussing, debating, analyzing the failures of the Empire. Because as I said in the opening of the second part of this series, this was a war they should have won. This is a military that conquered the galaxy, but it had some huge, glaring flaws. In the last two episodes, I discussed the Empire's xenophobia and poor decision-making, but those afflicted the entire Imperial military. There might be one more flaw or weakness that was actually the most critical. The Emperor's hubris, his own unflagging belief in his ultimate wisdom, which set the stage for his own demise. This battle, the Battle for Endor, would go down in the annals of history as one of the greatest examples of military hubris, like Hitler turning on Stalin during World War II, or Napoleon trying to invade Moscow, or Heron the Black's belief that dragon fire couldn't melt stone. As I mentioned last episode, Palpatine was setting one of the most elaborate traps in military history. He gave the rebels the intelligence telling them where the super weapon was, and the details of its protection and seduced them with the idea that they could kill both him and Darth Vader if they destroyed it. Think for a moment about the decision to give the Rebels this information. If he'd just waited, the second Death Star would have been unstoppable. Unlike the first Death Star, this model did not have a 3 meter exhaust port that could cause a massive explosion if he shot a proton torpedo inside of it. No weaknesses, a hyperdrive, a super laser, literally nothing could stop the second Death Star. Except for the pride of an aging Sith Lord. The Emperor's mistake was his pride, his hubris. When you pause to think about this battle, the most surprising or shocking or interesting part of the entire thing is this. Emperor Palpatine wanted it. If you are conceited enough to think that the Rebel Alliance could never defeat you, then you definitely would never even consider this small arboreal tree people could defeat you either. This is the commander. Moments ago, this ship received word of a Cylon attack against our home worlds is underway. As of this moment, we are at war. It's history. The North remembers. Mordor and cast back into the fiery chasm from whence it came. The events. Many Bothans died to bring us this information. The only good bug is a dead bug. Winter is coming. The figure. I take it will be a planet of apes. The Fellowship of the Ring. The drama. It, man. Game over, man. It's game over. The 4th of July will no longer be known as an American holiday. We know no king. But the king in the but north. But as the day when the world declared in one voice, we will not go quietly into the night. We will not vanish without a fight. You shall not pass. Today, we celebrate 
our Independence Day. It's a trap. It's hardcore history. It's almost surprising how many wars are defined by certain speeches. In our collective historical consciousness, when we think of great wars, we think of great speeches to go with them. Obviously, there's FDR after Pearl Harbor, Churchill after Dunkirk. That's just World War II. Or you could look at Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Or Captain Adama announcing to the crew of the Galactica that Cylons have returned. These speeches are burned into our collective consciousness. And the Galactic Civil War has one of those speeches, one of those lasting, indelible speeches made by Mon Mothma to her war council. You've probably seen it. Mon Mothma addressing the leadership of the Rebel Alliance, flanked by her two key lieutenants, the Admiral of the Alliance Fleet, brilliant tactician Admiral Jial Akbar, and the fierce soldier General Crix Maydeen. She announces that the rebels are going to battle, possibly the final battle to end this long war with the Empire. And I quote, The Emperor has made a critical error and the time for our attack has come. The data brought to us by Both and Spies pinpoints the exact location of the Emperor's new battle station. We also know that the weapon system of this new Death Star are not yet operational. With the Imperial fleet spread out throughout the galaxy in a vain effort to engage us, it is relatively unprotected. But most important of all, we learn that the Emperor himself is personally overseeing the final stages of construction of this Death Star. End quote. If you're looking for a final way to win an insurgency against an Emperor, destroying his super weapon and killing him in the process seems like a pretty good shortcut, doesn't it? You know the cheat code in video games? It sort of feels like the military version of that. The old Contra cheat code, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA, start. Now you have 30 extra lives, or in this case, you destroyed the second Death Star. Historians and military theorists have a different name for this, the Decisive Battle. If you think of the Greco-Persian Wars, what battle do you remember? If you're like most people, even casual observers of military history, it's probably the Spartans holding off the Persians before the Battle of Salamis. The 300, if you will. Even Wikipedia describes this battle as a decisive battle. But that war continued on for at least another year, eventually resulting in a stalemate. How is that a decisive battle? History, as I say almost every podcast, is never quite as neat as we'd like to make it. In the history of warfare, we love to glorify the decisive battle. Humans love narratives, and we love this narrative most of all. We want to describe as many wars as possible in terms of the decisive battle. The moment where everything turned. Americans celebrate the Battle of Gettysburg, but that war went on for two more years. The American Civil War hardly had a decisive battle, more like a final campaign. Humanity defeated the Harvesters on July 4, 1996, only to face an ongoing counterinsurgency battle with the remaining alien, and then they had to fend off a second attack 20 years later. The free peoples of Middle Earth seemed to fight decisive battle after decisive battle. They finally defeated Sauron at the Black Gate, but tell that to the hobbits who had to fight the Battle of Bywater to retake control of the Shire. In the Galactic Civil War, narratively, the Battle of Endor is the decisive battle each side wanted. The Emperor had gone to great lengths to reveal the Death Star's location, drop the plans into rebel hands, and even let his own men die to make it all look realistic. He saw this as a chance to wipe the Rebel Alliance out once and for all. This was a seductive vision, and the decisive battle is a seductive concept. According to their ancient lore, people strong in the dark side of the Force were often seduced by the appeals of easy victory. And, as Mon Mothma told us, we know the Rebels were looking for a final battle too. They believed, and were probably right, that this was their best and maybe last chance to defeat the Emperor. Because if they didn't, the second Death Star would wipe them out. For good. If you step back a bit, it isn't just amazing this Alliance managed to fight a war and win but that they were able to field an army at all. Almost as soon as the Clone Wars started, when Palpatine began consolidating more and more war power, some politicians in the Galactic Senate started to push back, making plans in case he took over to dissolve the Senate. One of those politicians was Mon Mothma. She'd been a senator in the Republic, 
but as years of war and decrees from the Emperor eroded the Galactic Senate's power, she began to form resistance cells. And when the Senate fell, she joined these cells full-time and became the leader of the Resistance. Initially, the Rebel Alliance spent years struggling to survive, let alone trying to fight the Empire, hopping planet to planet to avoid being wiped out entirely. Starting in Dantooine, their original base, the Rebel Alliance then had to move operations to Yavin. Following the destruction of the first Death Star, their first major victory, the Rebels then had to abandon that base. The Rebels hopped around after that, to planets like Pantora or Thela, but the histories of this time were pretty spotty, which is what you'd expect from an insurgency that isn't really putting their energy into keeping official records. The Rebellion's not like Alexander the Great, who brought historians along with him to record every place he went and conquered and how. In an insurgency, you don't really have that luxury. What we do know is, after hopping around from planet to planet, the Rebels eventually settled on the ice planet of Hoth, putting lots of time and energy into building Echo Base. Which should give you a sense of how desperate these Rebels really were. How effective can your rebellion be when you're trapped on an ice planet in the Outer Rim territories literally light years away from any relevant star system? It's like the perfect symbol for this rebellion, literally and figuratively frozen in place. But this base, too, was also discovered and destroyed, though not before the Rebel Alliance safely evacuated just enough ships and people to continue their admittedly weak insurgency. After that defeat, the Rebels jumped from system to system to avoid being destroyed. Some stories even have the Rebels jumping out of a galactic plane to hide, a tactic that would have been almost suicidal given the lack of navigational data. That is, until the Starfleet massed in Solos to prepare for this mission. Even calling it a Starfleet is stretching the truth about as far as it can go. The Rebels had a motley fleet cobbled together with stolen fighters or civilian freighters that were converted into battleships. One particular history describes it this way, and it's, it's so good I have to share it with you, and I quote, Corellian battleships, cruisers, destroyers, carriers, bombers, Solistan cargo freighters, Calamarian tankers, Alderanian gunships, Caselian blockade runners, Bastinian skyhoppers, X-wing, Y-wing, and A-wing fighters, shuttles, transport vehicles, and man of wars End quote. This motley fleet was manned by a motley crew, a collection of misfits, criminals, and rebels. See, when you have to fight a rebellion, you take whoever's help you can get. This has been true throughout time, like George Washington relying on Hessian irregular soldiers, or the Brotherhood Without Banners and Westeros, who accepted royalty, commoners, disgraced knights, and criminals, really whoever they could find. And the Rebel Alliance embraced this dynamic, relying on some of the most honorable beings in the galaxy, and some of the, how shall I say it, less savory characters? On the more honorable side, you'd have the former politicians, those members of the Galactic Senate who'd always bristled at Palpatine's power grab. I've already mentioned Mon Mothma, but there were others like Senator Bail Organa, a key politician and an ally of Mon Mothma, who was killed when the first Death Star blew up Alderaan. Unsurprisingly, the Rebels got a huge source of support from the surviving Alderanians. Again, I have no idea if this pronunciation is correct. We're talking about a planet from a long, long time ago, and, well, the pronunciation can be hard to pin down. The Alderanians were one of the victims of not only the greatest atrocity in this conflict, but in really any war in the multiverse. Grand Moff Tarkin ordered the destruction of Alderaan just to teach a lesson to the rebels, killing two billion people instantly. As we covered in Episode 1, Emperor Palpatine and Tarkin expected this bloodshed to crush the spirits of the Alderanians, but instead of caving, as Palpatine and Tarkin predicted, those who survived, those who were off-planet when it was destroyed, became fierce insurgents against the Empire, which probably makes more sense when you think about it. Many of their surviving ships joined the Rebel fleet, and many of their leaders joined the Rebel Alliance. Like Carlos Reacon, the general who ran Echo Base. Or Princess Leia Organa, the adopted daughter of Bail Organa. But the Alderanians weren't the only species the Empire had pissed off. Take the Mon Calamari, who the Empire enslaved to use their engineering expertise to build starships. The refugees who weren't enslaved put their full support behind the Rebel Alliance, 
like Admiral G.L. Akbar, famed tactician who became the commander of the Rebels' fleet. In terms of other species that the Empire pissed off, you could also look at the Wookiees of Kashyyyk. You know I'm a fan of the human condition, or in this case, I think I should say the sentient species condition. And sometimes I wonder which species really suffered the most under the Empire. It's hard to say any species got it worst of all of them, but it might be the Wookiees. The Empire declared that the Wookiees were non-sentient, a pretty neat little bureaucratic tool to just say some species isn't intelligent, and then enslaved as many as they could find. Some of these Wookiees who could escape joined the rebellion like Lagara, a famed female pilot. Or you could look at the planet of Solus, which the Imperials used as a manufacturing hub. The Empire constantly put down insurrections and uprising from Solistans bristling under their enslavement. So the rebels had a good supply of Solistan pilots. The first group was the people the Empire pissed off. Then the second group was the defectors. Former members of the Imperial Army, Navy, and Stormtrooper Corps. Those moral few who recognized or were disgusted by the evil of the Empire. Many of these defectors had witnessed Imperial atrocities firsthand. Most of the Alliance military leadership, from General Jan Dodonna to General Crix Medine, had defected from Imperial service. The most famous fighter pilot of the Alliance, the hero of the rebellion, Wedge Antilles, had previously flown TIE fighters in the Imperial Academy. One now seemingly discredited account differs, claiming that Antilles' girlfriend had been killed, but this is an example of the revisionist history that you'll find in this universe. It's sometimes hard to tell which story is true or which one is best or which one sounds like someone trying to fill in holes that just don't necessarily need to be filled. Of course, with defectors, you always had to question their loyalty. You never knew when a defector was a true believer or when he was a potential Imperial spy. And then... There were the criminals. I mentioned unsavory characters before, and the Rebellion was full of them. Many were criminals, bounty hunters, smugglers, and worse. Remember, it wasn't just law-abiding citizens who chafed under Imperial control. The most famous of these criminals was a Corellian smuggler by the name of Han Solo. Later, he became known as General Solo. And he's a fascinating character. He's like Indiana Jones if Indiana Jones trafficked illegal goods and was morally ambiguous at best. Solo was a smuggler, transporting whatever people put in his holds, from drugs to stolen goods. Though he allegedly wouldn't traffic in people or slaves, he had that sort of moral compass about him. Solo had killed many people, including multiple bounty hunters searching for him to claim a bounty that the tattooing gangster Job of the Hutt had put on him after Solo dropped a shipment of illegal drugs. Like I said, during a rebellion, you take who you can get, even people who are on the run from tattooing gangsters. On the one hand, without Solo, you have no rebellion, since his last-minute change of heart during the Battle of Yavin allowed the rebels to destroy the first Death Star before the first Death Star could destroy them. On the other hand, he's also a criminal, with little to no love for the Empire, but that didn't mean he loved the rebels. Again, if you couldn't trust Imperial defectors, how could you trust criminals? Solo was a controversial figure in the Alliance. Lots of people didn't like him or how close he was to Princess Leia. Indeed, most of the Rebel Alliance even realized that he and Leia had started a romantic relationship at this point in the Rebellion. Solo's right-hand man, or right-hand Wookiee, was Chewbacca. Chewie, as he was more affectionately known, was Solo's co-pilot, his enforcer, and his bodyguard with a penchant for threatening to rip the arms out of their sockets for anyone who crossed Solo. That said, Wookiee hatred for the Imperials is well known, as I just mentioned. Wookiees were used as slave labor to build Imperial projects. For years, the story was that Solo dropped out of Imperial flight school after allegedly witnessing Chewbacca being whipped and freed Chewbacca. This inspired his fierce loyalty, earning what Wookiees refer to as a life debt. Of course, as I just mentioned, the scholarship evolves. We're always learning more about this universe and uncovering new facts and new stories. A revised story has Solo freeing Chewbacca after a criminal disguised as an Imperial officer tried to feed Solo to Chewbacca. Then they joined the criminal's gang. This story was a bit darker, not as fun and humorous as you would hope, but still good. 
Han Solo wasn't the only criminal in the Rebellion. If Han Solo weren't in the room for the briefing, Lando Calrissian would be the shadiest character there. He's like a disreputable Indiana Jones, but with a gambling problem. And, as the more gossipy accounts have it, a lover of just about any person or species or robot. This is a man who had betrayed the Rebellion literally months before. He handed over Han Solo, Leia Organa, and others to Darth Vader on the cloud planet of Bespin, then he changed his mind and rescued them all. In the mission to come, Lando would fly with a trusted pilot, Nia Nub. Nub is one of those Solistins I just mentioned who'd chafed under Imperial domination. He was a pilot who hated the Empire and joined the Rebels. And he was also an arms dealer in a previous life. Again, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. The version of the name I'm reading has an N followed by a B, and I just have no idea what the correct way is to say that. So the Rebels were a motley fleet with a motley crew and little hope of survival. Until some Bothan spies discovered the existence of a second, still under construction, Death Star. The Bothan spies' intelligence lifted the spirits of the Rebellion. This information was brought directly to Mon Mothma and her war council, Admiral Akbar, General Medine, and others. When the time came to put people in charge, who did the Rebellion pick to lead this battle? They picked the criminals. They picked Lando Calrissian to lead the snub fighters attacking the second Death Star. Just as an aside, why did the Rebels choose Lando Calrissian to lead the fighter attack? They had Wedge Antilles, the hero of the Rebellion, a man who helped destroy the first Death Star and led Rogue Squadron, their elite fighter wing. And Akbar chose Calrissian? He just got there. The Rebels would entrust the entire ground campaign to Han Solo, who was given the title of General for this mission. Look, to quote Donald Rumsfeld, if you're Mon Mothma, you go to war with the army you have. She and the Rebellion leadership went all in on this mission, and they had to rely on some shady characters to do it. But while the Rebels thought they had the upper hand, they didn't. The Emperor's trap was working. The Rebels didn't know what they were walking into. The Rebels didn't know the Death Star was operational. They didn't know the Imperial fleet was waiting in orbit behind the forest moon. They didn't know the Emperor knew they were coming. And they didn't know how well armed the shield generator actually was. But none of it mattered because of the one other thing that the Emperor didn't know. There were bloodthirsty warriors on the forest moon. Mon Mothma's lead military advisor, General Crix Maydeen, planned the ground campaign. Maydeen is another one of those Imperial defectors joining the Rebellion after he played a role in releasing a plague on an entire planet. Sort of thing that might cause you to change your mind? His friends called him aggressive and confident. His detractors called him arrogant. But no one doubted his bona fides. In the Imperial Army, he'd led an elite group called the Storm Commandos. And he was also known for his attention to detail when planning military operations. And Maydeen selected Han Solo to lead the ground attack. Maydeen and Solo both hailed from Corellia, a planet known for its pilots and its adventurers. Part of Maydeen must have assumed a smuggler, thief like Han Solo could find his way into anything. Though he was morally dubious at best, Solo was known for getting out of tough scrapes, as if he could always save himself at the last moment, which is probably what Maydeen was banking on. Solo was like the kid in class who doesn't study for the test, but he still gets an A off natural smarts or flirting with the teacher. That's the type of person he was. The ground attack had two parts. First, Solo and the strike team on the stolen Imperial shuttle Tiderium would use hijacked access codes to gain access to the moon's surface. Once they landed, Solo and his team would infiltrate the base and blow it up. Sounds easy, right? Not if you listened to our last episode. A lot of people liked Solo, even if just as many didn't trust him, so he didn't have trouble finding volunteers for the ground attack. Solo picked as the leader of his strike team Major Bren Durlin, a veteran of the Hoth campaign. Durlin had been the head of security and operations of Echo Base and had fought in countless battles with the Rebel Alliance. His father was a senator who had been assassinated by Imperial agents, so Durlin had a grudge against Palpatine. You can toss him into that pissed-off category that I just mentioned above. Durlin's second-in-command was Lieutenant Judder Page, Page was also the son of a senator, but this time one still actively in Palpatine's service. Page had gone to the Imperial Academy, then defected, and also survived the battle on Hoth. 
In a lot of ways, the Empire defeated the Empire, especially since these ex-Imperials knew how the Empire worked and they could exploit its flaws. Together, Derlin and Page led the Pathfinders, a special forces team specializing in advanced tactics. And even the Rebel Alliance's special forces unit were as motley as the fleet above. One source described them this way. This unit was composed of elite ground fighters of the Rebel Alliance, a scruffy bunch in some ways they'd each been handpicked for initiative, cunning, and ferocity. Some were trained commandos, some were paroled criminals, but they all hated the Empire with a passion that exceeded self-preservation. End quote. Derlin and Page's lead non-commissioned officer was Kess Dameron, father of famed resistant pilot Poe Dameron. The Special Forces team was filled with grizzled veterans like this. Like Nick Sant, who was rumored to be a clone soldier named Captain Rex. Is this true? I don't know. It's a lot like the stories of people being at Woodstock in the 1960s. If you ask, everyone who was anyone went to that famous festival. This isn't the first time I've seen this. In Athens, Greece, every politician of a certain age talked about their involvement at the Battle of Marathon. Since the Alliance to Restore the Republic wrote the history of the battle, well, it seems like anyone who was anyone was there, from a legendary clone soldier to Dameron. Is it too much to believe? Maybe. But it makes a great story, doesn't it? The Pathfinders were known for their ability to move on a moment's notice to any planet of any type and be prepared to infiltrate. General Maydeen helped organize and train the Pathfinders, knowing that the Rebel Alliance needed a special operations capability like this. In other words, the perfect team to send to the surface of the forest moon no one had ever been to. I found this quote from Crix Maydeen that is just about perfect. It's from the Rebel Forces Special Forces Handbook. And I quote, In half an hour, I can put together a strike team of 20 soldiers capable of succeeding at any mission under any circumstances anywhere in the galaxy. Isn't that just awesome? Doesn't that just tell you how confident Maydeen was in his own abilities? He could put 20 soldiers anywhere in the galaxy and they'd get the job done? We keep finding new sources and new material from this galaxy, but I'll tell you, that's the story I want to hear. The Pathfinders hit the ground with traditional small arms weapons, comm leaks, low-level sensors, an E-Web repeating blaster, which was the equivalent of a laser machine gun, and a Caspel projector launcher, the equivalent of a mortar tube. They also carried a huge quantity of explosives to destroy the base. To show just how haphazard the Rebels operated, even though Han Solo had been tasked with one of the most crucial missions in the entire war, he hadn't really done his job. Again, why study in the weeks leading up to a test when you can just cram it all in the night before? When asked by Mame Dean if he had his team assembled, Solo admitted to a room full of soldiers that he had a team assembled, but not a command crew for a shuttle. Again, a critical mission, the critical mission of the war, and he hadn't even put together a crew. Of course, Solo would bring along his chief mate and personal bodyguard and enforcer Chewbacca. This would prove to be a pivotal decision, as we'll see. Then Princess Leia volunteered to join his crew. That's right, the Motley Rebels would send their chief diplomat, who had no military training, at least none officially, on this critical ground mission. To her credit, she was tough as a cray at Dragon's Tooth and had a long history of handling herself in just as tough situations. Just weeks before the Battle of Endor, Leia led the rescue of Solo from the clutches of Jabba the Hutt, killing hundreds of people and living beings when she blew up his sail barge. If I haven't emphasized this point yet, it should be clear, the rebels weren't afraid to get their hands dirty. They may have been fighting for freedom, but these freedom fighters had no compunction about taking a life or thousands. Solo was also joined by Luke Skywalker, who called himself a Jedi Knight at this time. He was a follower of the same religion as Darth Vader. Like Vader, the myths around Skywalker claimed he had elite fighting skills and some powers of mental telepathy. Luke Skywalker was also the pilot who destroyed the first Death Star, then aided Leia in rescuing Solo from the clutches of Jabba the Hutt. That, of course, begs the question of why he wasn't in space, as one of the best pilots in the Alliance fleet, but again, this was a motley crew, and the Rebellion's decision-making could often be haphazard at best. Solo also brought along two droids, an astromech eunuch and a protocol droid, or translator droid. The astromech droid, an R2 unit, was also useful. An R2 unit's like the Swiss army knife of droids, like a rolling workbench filled with all sorts of tools. 
one of those quirks of history that's hard to believe. R2-D2 had been on Luke's X-Wing fighter that destroyed the first Death Star. It's unclear why the Rebels brought the translator droid C-3PO, but he would wind up being extremely important. Again, haphazard decision-making. It's almost like they didn't want to leave their favorite droids at home and brought them to inhospitable terrain they wouldn't be ready for. But Solo, as I said, is lucky as a rabbit's foot. And it would turn out that he'd need both of these droids in the battle to come. One of the odd quirks about recounting events from a distant galaxy that may have occurred eons ago is that we really have no idea when the battle occurred. My gut instinct, like describing any war in the last 200 years or so, would be to include a date. On the morning of June 6, 1944, the Allies crossed the Channel, for example. Or, from July 25th to August 30th, 2552, the Humans in Covenant waged a battle on the planet of Reach. But that's not possible here. First, the Rebels left scant records of what days, what battles occurred. But do dates even matter on a galactic scale? Do they even matter across a relativistic universe? Though to be fair, this universe often seems like it behaves in non-relativistic ways, which is odd, but not much to say about that. All that said, there's one quirk or shortcut used by historians of this period and then by the New Republic. Every date is centered around the destruction of the first Death Star at the Battle of Yavin. And we know the Battle of Endor occurred three years after that time, or 3 ABY to historians. So in the year 3 ABY, General Solo landed the stolen shuttle Tidarium several miles from the shield generator. The plan was to hide the shuttle in the thousand-foot-tall trees, which they did, and camouflage it, which they did, and infiltrate the shield generator base on foot, which they did not. This was one of those missions that was destined to go poorly from the start. You can almost hear the muttering throughout the ages. As soon as they set out, General Solo and his team stumble across a stormtrooper scout patrol, two scout troopers, and two speeder bikes. You're thinking speeder bikes. Think levitating motorcycles with lasers on the front. And this is one of those key Han Solo moments. He tries to ambush the scout patrol, but doesn't realize that there are two more scouts with their own speeder bikes just a little ways away. This led to a high-speed chase through the trees. Luke and Leia managed to kill all four scout troopers, but those speeder bikes, given that name for a reason, go fast. So even a short chase put Luke and Leia some distance from the rest of their team. When Luke returned to the others, possibly hours later, Princess Leia was still missing. Solo had a tough decision here. Find your missing troops, or continue with the mission. Again, a mission that would save the galaxy from their combination of Genghis Khan, Hitler, and Stalin. So he split his forces. He sent his strike team on ahead, and he went with Chewbacca and Luke to search for Leia. This was probably the best of two bad options. The fleet was coming regardless, so you needed people in place. Major Durlin continued with the mission. The Pathfinders went on to the shield generators with plans to link up with Solo at 030. What happened next to the Pathfinders is a fun story in its own right and probably one you're not familiar with. After traveling for more than a few hours, Durlin and his crew hunkered down in a ravine for the night, waiting for their rendezvous the next day. Almost as soon as their first night's watch began, their sensors discovered an ATST patrolling the area. Likely the ATST wasn't searching for the Pathfinders in particular, but still the risk of discovery was huge. That's the whole mission right there. ATSTs could wipe out entire companies. If you're Durlin, what do you do? You can't attack it outright. That's just going to alert the Imperial forces that you're already there. And it's probably a suicide attack. But the ATST was barreling down on their position, walking down the ravine. How could Durlin destroy it without alerting everyone else? Well, he didn't have to. One of his young soldiers, not under orders, fired a gas canister from the projectile launcher into an open viewport, forcing the Imperial troops to abandon the ATST. They were promptly captured by the rebels, meaning that the rebels once again rolled snake eyes, winning this little skirmish without alerting the Imperials. Meanwhile, Solo set out with Luke Skywalker and Chewbacca and the two droids who seemed to follow them everywhere to search for Leia. They had an even worse time of it than Durlin. Solon was able to find the remains of Leia's stolen speeder bike, which crashed during the chase, but he couldn't find any signs of her. Then, Chewbacca smelled some dead meat. 
Remember, he was a Wookiee, a large bear-like species with heightened senses. But Chewbacca and the others didn't realize that this was one of the Ewoks' boar wolf traps. I'd mentioned them before, but boar wolves were massive creatures the Ewoks hunted for meat, and vice versa. So massive creatures needed massive traps. Sure enough, when Chewbacca reached the dead animal, the Ewoks' trap was sprung. General Solo and his team found themselves dozens of meters off the ground in a giant net. Eventually, R2-D2, their astromech unit, used a small circular saw to cut them out, and they came crashing to the ground. Before they could move, the Ewoks had surrounded them and took the rebels captive. I want to linger just slightly on a point here. Moments before Han Solo and his team were swept up in the massive net, R2-D2 reported that he couldn't find any signs of life in the area around the crashed speeder bike. But after cutting their way out, the rebels were surrounded by dozens of Ewoks. How did R2-D2 not sense any life forms on the planet? The first explanation is that the Ewoks are so fast that they heard the trap spring and manage to surround the rebels in minutes. Really though, we know how fast Ewoks can run, and it's not fast. They have stubby little legs and sort of waddle around. They're skilled in a lot of ways, but wind sprints is not one of them. So speed is out as an explanation. Second explanation is that the Ewoks had mastered stealth technology. This is obviously absurd since there's no evidence of any level of technological sophistication by the Ewoks. They could build gliders, but not sophisticated cloaking technology. The explanation I like is the most obvious. Human sensors were next to worthless on Endor. Remember, technology broke down on Endor almost as soon as it arrived there. Do you ever hear stories on film sets about filming in the jungle? How everything is constantly breaking down? It's like that. Talk to a veteran of the Iraq War about cleaning dust out of everything. Or a pilot trying to maintain aircraft in Pandora's gravity wells. Really, the massive amount of life on Endor probably confounded all traditional forms of detection. It's not that there were no life forms, but probably too many for the sensors to count. Keep this in mind as we prepare for the final battle. The Ewoks had an incredible advantage over the Imperials they hadn't exploited. Yet. No matter the explanation, the Ewoks had the Rebels surrounded, spears thrust in their faces, and were all set to take the Rebels captive. Until they saw C-3PO. These spear-wielding bear creatures leaped to the ground, bowing and chanting. To them, 3PO was a god. Specifically, the Golden God prophecy that we had mentioned last episode. The Ewoks believed the Golden God would return and lead the Ewoks. And they thought this protocol droid, who was gold-colored, was that god. Hence the bowing and the chanting. Which looked good for Solo, Luke Skywalker, and Chewbacca, except the Ewoks still took the rebels captive and still brought them back to Bright Tree Village. I've tried to avoid using the word primitive to describe the Ewoks. Often, primitive can serve as a sort of slur by people who think they're superior to peoples and beings and species that they actually aren't. The Ewoks didn't have technology like the humans, but they were advanced in many ways. They had the power of flight, for example, and their architecture. Giant tree forts, dozens of meters in the air, can only be described as incredible. But they did worship a cowardly, whiny protocol droid as their god. And they had another habit that is also troubling. Eating other sentient species. I want to use the word cannibalism, but it doesn't really apply here. That's eating your own species. But the Ewoks found the rebels in a net that they designed to capture food. And it appeared like they were still going to eat what they caught. I say appeared because it wasn't like the Ewoks marched the rebels back into their own power with their hands tied behind their backs. No, the Ewoks took the rebel leadership, General Solo, Chewbacca, Jedi Knight, Skywalker, and their astromech droid back the way they would have brought back a boar wolf, hanging upside down from poles. At Bright Tree Village, the hunting party presented the rebels to Chief Chirp and Shaman Lagray. Our golden god has returned, they said. Oh, and we also got dinner. C-3PO was placed in a chair of honor at the front of the dining area, and the rest of the rebels were placed over fires on cooking spits. It's like something out of one of those old-timey cartoons where you see the, the chicken and the campsite resting on sticks. It looked a little bit like that. Then they saw Princess Leia. What did happen to Leia? 
She was also brought to Bright Tree Village, but as an honored guest instead of, say, that evening's dinner. During the speeder bike chase in which she and Luke killed four stormtroopers, Leia was knocked unconscious. When she awoke, she found an Ewok scout poking her with a stick. This was Wicked, who I mentioned last episode. Wicked was a fairly important Ewok as the lead scout of Bright Tree Village, though he was young for that role. After killing a stormtrooper together, they returned to Bright Tree Village as allies. When the rebels arrived, Princess Leia came out to find them hanging from poles. So Solo ended up finding Leia, inadvertently, again, the luck of this guy. But it was luck, up to a point. Again, you're lucky to find your missing princess, but some Ewoks plan to make you their main course for dinner for their golden god. As I said, the Ewoks plan to eat what they captured. And they clearly plan to do so with the rebels in what they described as a banquet in C-3PO's honor. As I said about Crix Maydeen at the start of the episode, he picked Han Solo because he knew he could get his way out of a tight spot. Solo would need to rely on that luck right now. We've been telling you about Otta Babel on this program for a long time. And there's a reason that you hear us discuss them as often as we do. It's because we love reading, and Otta Babel has a ton of options for us to choose from. Literally, it is all of them. Because Otta Babel is the audiobook site for the Library of Babel. If you're not familiar, what is the Library of Babel? It's a series of hexagonal rooms containing every book possible. Each book is 410 pages, each page has 40 lines, and each line has approximately 80 letters. And this library contains every possible iteration of those letters and those books. That's right, the Library of Babel is now part of Audibabel, an Amazon company, the everything store, am I right? Sure, it's mostly a combination of random letters, which makes just a seemingly endless amount of nonsense text, but every so often you stumble upon a fragment of text that actually makes sense. Or text in an ancient form of Portuguese. Listen, it's the Library of Babel, they aren't all going to be winners. In fact, it's mostly not good. Again, an infinite supply of titles has really gummed up the search engine and algorithms. Recently, I've been listening to XJVSDDH, but remember the letters on the outside of the book neither indicate nor prefigure what's on the inside of the book. If XJVSDDH isn't your cup of tea, Otta Babel has a seemingly infinite amount of nonsense text for you to listen to. But that's Otta Babel. They're always adding titles. It's the world's greatest audiobooks, and we're glad to have them as a sponsor. You can get a free audiobook with a 30-day trial. Go to audible.com slash fake ad and listen for a change. I want to read three different quotes about the Ewoks from some of the first-hand accounts I've used this series. The first one comes from the first expedition to the forest moon by Lieutenant Kiviet, and I quote, I made my report to Captain Toss. His laughter only added to my own embarrassment. Endor's moon would be perfect. Surely I wasn't put off by a few natives with drums if they became a problem he assured me that a swift genocide could be arranged. End quote. The second comes from the xenophobic scientist who led the second expedition to the forest moon. Ewoks practically infest the forest with their tree villages. It would give me no greater pleasure than to burn down these clumsy and primitive structures. But the task is far too great for our small party. I would suggest, though, that if the Emperor intends to make any substantial use of this forest moon, he see to it that the Ewoks are exterminated before they can cause significant damage with their ignorant meddling. End quote. Finally, we have a quote from Sergeant Hume Tarl, one of the fir- only first-person accounts we have from a stormtrooper on the ground. We paid them no mind. They didn't seem inclined to cause problems. That would have led to an excision within a defined perimeter. End quote. Isn't that such a chilling euphemism? It's like the definition of Orwellian, but not the inaccurate, commonly used meaning, which just means the opposite. No, Orwellian in the original, often more chilling sense of using overtly bureaucratic language to hide the true meaning of a phrase. Luckily, the other two quotes spell it out for us. Genocide. Extermination. 
This all leads me to a final very dark, ugly question I want to ask to conclude the episode. A question that if we're thinking about the cold calculus of absolute war, must be asked. What if the Empire had exterminated the Ewoks? More importantly, why didn't they? In retrospect, it's a terrifying thought that if the Empire had killed all the Ewoks before the war began, the galaxy would still be in control of Emperor Palpatine. And I want to be clear, I'm not endorsing this. This is like asking, what if Hitler hadn't betrayed the Russians? I'm not supporting Palpatine's ideology. I'm questioning his choices from his point of view. The thing I want to know is why didn't the Empire commit a campaign of genocide against the Ewoks? Why didn't they send speeder bikes and ATSDs out to every village within 100 miles and kill them all? We know it wasn't compassion. This was an empire that would blow up entire planets, killing billions, exterminating millions of species as a show of force. Grand Moff Tarkin blew up Alderaan to find out the location of a base. Clearly they were not adverse to a few deaths if it was in their interest. What's an Ewok village or two compared to a whole planet? The morality is reprehensible from our perspective, but clearly not an Imperial officer's. Was it fear? Fear of dying? Fear of death? Seems unlikely. No one really thought the Ewoks posed any sort of a threat. Each quote makes that clear. What about xenophobia? The Empire, seemingly from the Emperor straight down to his ground troops, paid no regard to the Ewoks, considering them a nuisance at best. Despite its massive resources, the Empire's officers probably considered violence against the Ewoks to be a waste of time and money. You can just imagine some paper-pushing bureaucrat somewhere. What is the cost of this gas canister? Is it worth killing an Ewok or destroying an Ewok village? I don't think so. Denied. The real answer is probably just inertia. Simple bureaucratic inertia. As we discussed last episode, most soldiers in the Empire focus more on not screwing up and not getting killed rather than being proactive with bravery and smart decision-making. There probably isn't one right answer. All three of these potential explanations could have played a role in the Empire's decision not to do anything about the Ewoks. No one wanted to venture too far into this dangerous force, and none of them thought that the Ewoks were worth the trip. But as we'll discover next episode, they were anything but harmless, cute, and fuzzy. Michael here, one half of the creative team behind Spec Media with the ubiquitous, nay, cliched podcast housekeeping notes. First up, the main question is, hey, where you guys been? Well, we really appreciate you asking. It's one of the things, uh, hearing from fans, that made us want to come back and keep doing the podcast, which we love doing. The second part of that is, well, life got really, really busy. One half of our creative team got married had a baby, but luckily we're back on track and we have a great plan to keep episodes coming out through the rest of the year. The schedule is we're going to plan to finish season one, which is what we're currently on, including an episode on a famous sci-fi action film from the 1980s that'll come out next. And we plan to keep having episodes coming out every three to four weeks through the end of the year. Next year, we're going to start season two and we have a ton of ideas of things to spoof. So that's the plan. We also plan to do a bonus Q&A episode at the end of the season. So if you have any questions about Ewoks, Star Wars, podcasts, spoofs, plans, anything, send us via tweet or email. The email's on our website. Now we need to ask for your help. To quote Andy Dufresne, if you've come this far, perhaps you're willing to go just a little bit further. That's right. We're going to ask you to rate and review the podcast on iTunes. Across the multiverse, every timeline, every dimension, everywhere, iTunes dominates and its Apple reviews really, really do matter. We'd prefer this timeline, but any timeline you want to review uh, works for us. It really does help spread the word. So we want to encourage you. We're going to thank everyone who leaves a review and read some of the best ones on the podcast. So big ups to Mark Harper 147 C. Ferg's 2012, Terp 19, Rush Return, Resmo, Rod the Bod 18, who we might be related to, Defel John, Chris Renball, to Not Mike 721, though. You know who you are and you know what you did. A final request follow us on social media if you don't already, at Spec Media Pod or on Facebook, and then share the podcast on every social platform you can. That really does help Twitter, Facebook, Reddit. I mean, come on, like the folks over at Reddit, those uh, sci fi fans, they, this type of thing they'll love. So we appreciate it in advance, and we'll see you next episode. <laughs>